In the last few years, the Total War series has become known for its massive fantasy titles, most notably the Warhammer games. Since 2016, this fantasy DNA has crept into the series' other games, the largest of these being Total War Three Kingdoms. This game, set in ancient China, has experienced massive success in the past years, and many were notably upset when development on the game stopped after about two years of expansions and an announcement of a spiritual sequel coming sometime in the future. I've never been much of a fan of Chinese history, and Three Kingdoms never really excited me all that much. I played it at launch and liked it, only to stop a few weeks later. Seeing as this game is still experiencing success though, I thought it was time to return to China, giving you an up-to-date review of the game and taking a look at what makes Three Kingdoms stand apart in an easy to understand and to the point way. And if that sounds good to you, I hope you leave a like, a comment, subscribe to the channel and consider supporting me on Patreon. Any donations would be appreciated and would allow me to continue making videos just like this one and others like it. And now, Total War Three Kingdoms. We begin with the campaign and I want to begin with the obvious and the aspects which really hit the eyes first because they've meant so much for my enjoyment or lack thereof in this game. Three Kingdoms, as a first in the Total War series, is exclusively set in ancient China, far away from the familiar lands of Europe and its neighborhood. It's a massive change in several ways, most eye-catchingly so in terms of geography. Total War Three Kingdoms makes use of a noticeably well-updated engine this time, which means night and day in terms of visuals and performance when compared to the likes of Attila and Warhammer 2. Its impact is perhaps felt the most on the Grand Campaign map, and I really do mean grand. China is enormous in terms of land mass and scale in this game, really showcasing how far Total War has come in its quest for a representation of geography as it is in real life. The new engine sports a stylistic change here, turning away from the more realistic look of the European games to a more culturally distinct look. We see this move everywhere, from the way mountains are represented, now being tall and rounded as if in a painting, to the forests and rivers stretching across the land, and including the cities, feeling a bit less tangible now, almost as if they're placed by a stroke of the brush. Aesthetically, China has been made as beautiful and distinct as can be then, neither looking like its European counterparts, nor what we have seen in the more recent, more realistic, yet somehow uniquely stylistic Troy map. There's very little negative to say about the art direction itself here, and I commend the artists for their wonderful work. However, when it comes to playability and how the visuals factor in here, the picture changes somewhat. I'm only speaking for myself here, so your background might differ from mine. That being said, I'm no Chinese geography expert, and even though it might be on my end then, I generally do not believe that the Chinese geography lends itself well to Total War games and perhaps strategy games on this scale in general, and I'll explain why. Take the Mediterranean, the theater of the majority of Total War games. I am of the mind that there is no more beautiful and appropriate place to be when building an empire. You see, here, at the intersection between East and West, we have such clearly defined geographical landmasses. Each landmass is so clearly outlined, whether we're talking about Iberia, Italy, Greece, or Turkey, all uniquely shaped and partially surrounded by water. We have the beautiful curves of North Africa and the Levant, and whether we're talking about Arabia or Britain, no area is either too large nor similar to other places on the map. Back to China then, and the situation is turned on its head. China is essentially one giant piece of land, with no large bodies of water to separate one kingdom from another and make it that much easier to know where you are, defend your flanks, or plan where to go next. And this is where the visuals come in. As beautiful as they are, I actually have a rather hard time of getting my bearings, since around 90% of China consists of large open fields, separated only by small rivers or copy-pasted lonely mountain chains. There's just something about the art style that makes me feel like what I'm seeing isn't really there, especially when it comes to the cities, which all look more or less similar, and have no unique buildings appear as you build them, at least to my knowledge. This might sound nitpicky to many, and that's completely understandable, but to me, this sense that there are no beautiful islands or peninsulas to look at, or even to break up the landmasses, and further that you're virtually always surrounded by factions exactly because of China's geographic layout, is partially the reason why I just don't have as much fun here. Everything is actually made worse in my opinion when we factor in the UI. I'll just say it, Total War Three Kingdoms has the absolute worst UI in the history of Total War games. It's just plain painful to look at, and has been a big factor in me not playing the game more. That's not to say it's ugly, in fact, it's quite the opposite. I think the artwork is absolutely gorgeous, be it for faction events, 
building chains, or the research tree. But again, the style just completely hampers the utility and gameplay value for me. I think it first and foremost comes down to style over utility. The UI is essentially black and white, extremely contrasted and makes it at times physically hard to read what's going on when events pop up time and time again. When clicking on cities, the building UI shades the lower part of the screen, and even the small factor of the black background somehow makes it much harder to understand what's going on, especially when so many of the building artworks kind of look similar at first glance. There's been much talk of how beautiful the technology tree is, and I would agree, but I also think it's the least readable tree we've ever gotten. It's often hard to know which tech belongs to which branches, and I often feel like I'm just clicking on new tech willy-nilly, because the sense of progression is so divided into piecemeal ups and downs compared to, for example, Attila's very straightforward system. In addition, I have a personal vendetta against the way cities are represented in this game, and I'm talking about two things here. First are the city banners. The banners, all endowed with the face and faction banners of their owners, simply take up way too much space on the screen, and there's no way to independently turn them off or reduce them. Along with the rest of the UI, which is tacked onto virtually every corner, they simply clog up the screen, and essentially forces you to zoom all the way down if you want a clear picture of your realm. Second, I absolutely believe that CA should have come up with another approach to cities in this game. China simply hosts so many enormous cities that there are virtually endless of them wherever you look, and there's little room for else. Instead, I think they should have gone with something more similar to the Shogun 2 model, perhaps cutting the amount of cities in three, but instead leaving a bunch of smaller towns that served as far of land or other sources of production. Lastly, and I promise this is the last rant I'll go on, and again, this is a personal grievance which I might be alone in feeling. Regardless, there are simply too many factions on offer here. And now you might ask how that can possibly be a bad thing. Well, I'll tell you. And a word of advice, don't doubt my ability to find negatives in great games. You're gonna lose every time. Now, Rome 2 is considered one of the largest Total War games ever and the original Grand Campaign sports a staggering 117 factions spread across the entirety of Europe, North Africa, and West Asia. These factions have unique names like Rome, Carthage, Macedon, and Bactria, and clicking on a faction in the Diplomacy menu, which you can only really do if you've encountered the said faction, takes you straight to them, so you always know where they are. Enter Three Kingdoms, where the original campaign, Rise of the Warlords, sports an unbelievable 190 factions, raced all the way up to 281 in the Eight Princes campaign. Now I feel the need to reiterate that I am neither an expert on Chinese history, nor familiar with the romance of the Three Kingdoms stories, so this might first and foremost stem from my lack of familiarity with Chinese history and names. Having said that, you might understand my frustration and perplexity when faced with hundreds of factions all named after individual people not distinct nations or kingdoms or even simple dynasty names. And I will be butchering these names, so I apologize for this in advance, but for an uneducated European, instead of seeing faction names like the Kingdom of Wei or Shu Han, which we might once the three kingdoms are actually forged, I'm met with separate factions named Wan Shao and Wan Shu, Liu Bao and Liu Bu, Shang Wan, Sheng Zhan, and Liu Dai, Liu Yao and Liu Yu. Seeing how this is the case, I often get into situations where some people I have no familiarity with have names so similar to others that it takes me a while to understand who I'm dealing with or who the heck is showing up in my notifications about war and peace. Even worse is that if a faction leader dies, the name of the successor becomes the new name of said faction, creating even more confusion. It doesn't help that the faction banners are so similar as well. Despite maybe sporting different colors, Faction ownership is not nearly as clear as in any other strategy game I've ever played. Now, I realize doing this in any other way in terms of names would be anachronistic, but this just makes this aspect an inherent downside of this era of Chinese history for me. What makes matters worse is that the diplomacy interface, which we will get back to, is so bad when it comes to faction placement clarity. What I mean by this is that you can actually negotiate with factions you haven't met on the campaign map yet, and so, when trying to see where this faction actually exists, you can't. This means dealing with people you have no idea where they are, which makes for a frustrating diplomatic experience. Again, it kind of boils down to simply how much is on offer here, be it landmass or cities or factions or people, 
And in this case, I really am of the mind that much less is indeed much more. And with that, rant over. Total War 3 Kingdoms campaign mechanics ushered in what I believe can only be called a turning point in the Total War franchise, namely because it changed things up in two important areas. The first is faction diversity and unique mechanics. In Three Kingdoms, as a first for at least semi-historical Total Wars, each playable faction comes with their very own innate faction mechanics and strengths, of a completely different magnitude than what we'd seen before. You can now choose your faction based on what kind of playstyle you want, meaning that one faction, like that of Cao Cao, focuses on military expansion and intrigue, providing you with a spicy, slightly more diplomatic takeover on the traditional Total War campaign, while another faction like that of Kong Rong might be focused on trade expansion, essentially having one of Total War's first tall faction campaigns, offering their own spin on things and makes every faction you play as so much more unique than in previous games. The second aspect is diplomacy itself, which partially branches out of these new faction mechanics. Total War finally took a page from the Book of Paradox this time and let us not only negotiate trade agreements, but create unique vassal types and annex them afterwards, coalitions, trade regions, and most importantly, made negotiating the best it's ever been by showing us how likely a faction is to agree to a proposal by the numbers. This revolutionizes diplomacy, and since CA would go on to implement the same system in a Total War Saga Troy, I have really high hopes that we will see it taken further into the next major historical title as well. Further, a cool mechanic known as Prestige, where you attempt to reach the highest tiers of power in China, which will open up diplomatic opportunities and gameplay changes, is something every faction will strive for. What's cool is that even though expanding your territory might be the traditional way of collecting prestige, it's not the only way. For smaller focused factions, it's enough to be rich as heck and manage to construct higher tier buildings for a nice prestige boost that way instead. The climax of this is the creation of the titular Three Kingdoms, which creates the endgame challenge of having to wage war against two other massive kingdoms, now with easy to remember names, at the same time. All of this comes together to create a campaign that, while sometimes without much direction, tension or purpose seems much more deliberately designed and balanced than other Total War games. And that is a good sign for the future, I think. Finally, we have the character system, which is the deepest one yet. Characters can be given retinues and items which impact their skills and abilities, and the same goes for the level system, which one must pay attention to if you want new abilities and buffs for both your general and the units under their command. And speaking of armies, we have an interesting new system here. Armies are now divided into generals' retinues essentially, having a maximum of 3 generals per army. Each general can further command up to 6 units each, and the type of units available are determined by the type of general that commands them, so only a strategist will be able to recruit trebuchets for example. It's an interesting system, and definitely adds to strategic thinking, but I can't help but feel like the lack of actual army barracks is determining which units you can recruit, which has always been the norm in these games, is quite confusing at first but has the long-lasting impact of not making me as attached to my cities as in other games since there is no real need to protect them in order to secure a special elite barracks, for example. I do enjoy though that the newly recruited units need to be mustered before they're fully ready for battle. By far the most awesome thing about Three Kingdoms in my opinion, apart from the diplomacy changes of course, are the genuinely fantastic battles. What just keeps baffling me are how gorgeous these scenes are. I think Three Kingdoms is the first Total War game where I cannot find any flaws with the battle maps when it comes to visual fidelity. Not only are they so stylistically amazing, trees looking crisp, fields being large yet easy to cross, sporting gorgeous skies and equally beautiful reflections, but more importantly, the units in this game are so detailed and of such high quality that I'm running out of hyperbolic words to use for them. Some of these scenes are taken straight out of the movies, and even though the same could be said for many Total War games, it has never been more true than right here. To top it all off, it all runs so smoothly, and I'm so appreciative of the developer's optimization work in this game. What's more is how things actually works and feels, and even here Three Kingdoms does an excellent job. It's easier than ever to move your units around the battlefield, and I love how your formations are not instantly messed up when reorganizing them to another location. And speaking of locations, the maps feel like actual real-life fields and locations now never putting you in awful steep places, but offering fields with several strategic hills for you to tactically place your armies on. I also like the flow of siege battles, with units seeming a lot more aware of where they are and how to get to places, and because things don't really lag as much, has a much better sense of functionality to them. But perhaps the coolest thing is how powerful cavalry charges are, as you can really feel the impact of dozens of trampling horses crashing into a unit of infantry. 
The collision and sense of physics in Three Kingdoms really does feel like a big step up from previous Total War games in my opinion, and are just a pleasure to play. If there is one thing I personally think is somewhat of a downside, it's how similar the units are both within and across factions. While some units beautifully stand out, being clad in heavy armor and looking unique, the majority of the units, and this goes for virtually every faction, look more or less like peasant units, just in different colors. Contrasted with the more heavily armored or unique looking European units during the equivalent Roman or medieval eras is a stark contrast then. And even though I can't complain too much because this is a kind of historical authentic thing, it's another inherent aspect of ancient China which to me makes the game a bit less fun than another setting or time period could have been. Either way, there is something so culturally and stylistically unique about this game, which has been so amazingly translated to the battlefields as well, and is just impressive honestly. I love 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 the inclusion of banner carriers for example, which completely negates the need for floating UI banners hovering over every unit. There's just a sense of competence and understanding that I don't think I've seen in another Total War game that I'm honestly baffled, and imagining this level of perfection in a Total War era just a tad closer to my heart honestly gives me butterflies. I couldn't sleep last night because I imagined a future Medieval 3 and Rome 3 and Empire 2 looking and playing this perfect, and that's perhaps the biggest compliment I can give this game. Of course, there is the matter of romance and records mode, giving the vibe of this being more or less a supernatural game, but for the most part, this is relegated to the battles. In romance mode, characters will be godlike heroes taking on entire armies by themselves, and for this reason I much prefer the records mode, where generals are tied to generals bodyguard units like in previous historical total wars. Luckily, it's up to you to choose which mode you want to play. So. It's 2022, and Creative Assembly has by now long since stopped the development on this game after several major updates and expansions, mostly keeping the same campaign map, but changing the time period to include different factions, units, and scenarios. In other words, should you play Three Kingdoms now, when it's all there and complete and nice and tidy? I'd say it first and foremost comes down to your preference of setting and location. Game mechanically, Three Kingdoms is close to perfection innovating in every area of gameplay, visuals, and performance. It definitely stumbles in certain areas, like in its hard to read UI due to the sheer amount of objects on the screen, its high contrast menus and style over utility interface, but it also excels in terms of battles and scale, offering something quite unlike anything Total War has offered in the past. If you don't have the same nagging relationship with the game's UI and setting, in fact, if you like it or even find them interesting, I'd say Three Kingdoms is a must play as on its own, most of what is here is quite astonishing really. But if you're like me, and you can definitely enjoy the battles and aspects of the campaign, but have little interest in Chinese history, or be prone to finding the UI frustrating, I'd say wait for a deep sale, or perhaps don't bother at all, as Total War games generally demand a lot of time and energy to play, and your time is better spent in a Total War game you really think you love rather than one you just feel so-so about. That being said, Three Kingdoms is overall a competent and innovative Total War game I'm glad is here, as it really proved what Creative Assembly is capable of, and I cannot wait to see where they will take this inspiration and newfound joy of complexity in the future. And that was Total War Three Kingdoms, one of the largest Total War games ever made. I hope you enjoy my ramblings, and I really do apologize for the rant, but I really felt the need to share my opinions on those aspects and it feels really good to finally have them out there. If you're like me, or if you disagree with me or have other opinions entirely, then make sure to let me know in the comments below. If you enjoyed the video, I hope you leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon, which really helps me and the channel continue putting out videos just like this one and others. Make sure to join our Discord as well, the link is in the description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Cheers!